Robin Blumner. I am CEO of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and I'm welcoming all of you here tonight. We're going to have an evening of a little bit of science, a little bit of blasphemy, and a lot of fun. So hold on to your seats. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Well, I, I want to give you a, a general sense of what's going to happen tonight. We have uh, Richard and Julia coming on in a minute. They will be speaking for something about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we're going to make it your turn. So we'll, we'll bring the house lights up a bit. And we will have roving microphones. We'll have two down here in the orchestra. We will have one in the balcony. balcony. So if you want to ask a question, raise your hand at that time and we'll try to get the microphone to you. And we'll do that for about a half hour. And then after that, uh, in a room uh, outside uh, behind the, the doors there, we will have book signing availability. And Richard uh, and Julia will both be there to sign books for you. Um, and we will, we will be there till the last book is signed. So even though the line might be, be long, rest assured that uh, Richard makes, makes it a point to get every book signed uh, when you come with a book. And there's also a, a book sale opportunity there. So if you didn't come with a book or you want additional books, they'll be available for you. So you might wonder why we chose to come to Rochester, Minnesota, out of all places. Uh, we, we were urged here by, by uh, Glenn Gaunt, who is in, in the audience here, and he really is the reason we are here tonight. So thank you, Glenn. Uh, but there's another reason, and, and may, you know, it might be apocryphal, it might not be true, but I understand that out of every city in the upper northwest, uh, or the upper midwest, that this one has the highest IQ. <laughs> so you're our, you're our natural people, you're, you're one of us, so we're asking you also to be one of us and join the Richard Dawkins Foundation. If you haven't already, just go on the website, richarddawkins.net slash join, and, and become a member. Be a proud card-carrying member of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. So now, it's my deep honor and pleasure to introduce Julia Sweeney, who is a remarkable actor, writer, comedian. You'll, you know her from Saturday Night Live. You know her from her extraordinary one-woman show, Letting Go of God, and her partner in conversation tonight, a man who truly for this audience needs no introduction, the remarkable and amazing Richard Dawkins. out. It's such an honor for me to be here and getting to talk to Richard Dawkins, who is I'm such a big fan of and was such a big part of my um, beautiful loss of faith story. Um, and so um, I'm so excited to be able to talk to him. But one thing I was waiting to ask him um, until he was here, and I know a little bit about it, but I wanted you to elaborate about your own religious experience. Like when did you what kind of religion were you brought up in, if you were? And tell me about when you realized what, that it maybe wasn't the path for you. Well, Julia, I wish I had a good story to tell like yours, <laughs> because um, your story in Letting Go of God, of course, is absolutely riveting and holds audiences spellbound for, what is it, two hours? Yes, let's talk um, about me. Well, we'll, no, do uh, that. we'll do that no. in a moment. We'll do that no, in a no, moment. No, but I um, just know, like... my, my story, my equivalent of your two-hour story, takes about 15 seconds. Okay, well, I want to hear um, it. 
Okay. Um, I, for a start, I, I had the good fortune not to be brought up Catholic. Um, so, uh, I was brought up with the, the weak tea version, the, the, the homeopathic version, the Anglican. Um, so, and, and my parents actually were not and are not religious, um, but I was sent to Anglican schools where we went to chapel every day and we did prayers every day and things, and we learned scripture. Um, but it, we, it wasn't really thrust down our throats, and so I wouldn't say that I had the, the same indoctrination to overcome. But did your parents believe in God? No. Uh, but they didn't say that? They didn't or? say that, no. Um, they, I mean, they, they took us to church on Easter and Christmas and, and um, gave me a Bible when I was confirmed. And uh, they didn't, like, you didn't, they didn't talk about their relationship to God? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was confirmed into the Church of England. And how old were you? Then? Thirteen. Thirteen. Uh, and so at the age of about nine, I think I started to get doubts when I think my mother pointed out to me that there were lots and lots of religions. Oh. And it was immediately clear to me there was no obvious reason why the one I was brought up in was the correct one. I mean, it is a remarkable fact that a lot of people feel, isn't it good of God to make it that the, the one true religion happens to be the one I happen to have been brought up in? <laughs> Yes. Well, I tumbled to that at about nine. Uh, but then I went back. I'm not quite sure why. And I was confirmed at the and age of 13. And did your parents push you to be confirmed? No. Or were there other kids? Like that uh, everybody, everybody at the school was confirmed. Everybody but what about in your family? Were you uh, an only child? Or? Mm, I'm not an only child. Um, no, I, I, there was no special pressure from, from, from the family. Everybody in the school, except there was one boy who was Roman Catholic. Um, and he wasn't, I mean, he was presumably was confirmed at the age of about two or something, I don't know. No, no, it's 12. It's oh, okay. the same age, okay, just right. a different ceremony. Okay, right. Um, so, um, and we all had to go to church every Sunday. He went to a different church um, in the company of the very attractive young assistant matron. So we rather envied him, his, <laughs> his Roman Catholicism. Um, but when you were 13 <coughs> and being confirmed, even though you had doubts... No, I, I believed it then, and, and I attended confirmation classes with the vicar, uh -huh. who was a kind of uncular man, and talked complete nonsense, but I had no... I, I, I didn't realize it was nonsense. I struggled right. to understand it. It was only later I realized it was nonsense. And so then when... How did you realize it was nonsense? Was there a moment, or was it just a gradual uh, thing? I gradually lost Christianity, and then was left with a kind of deistic belief that there must be some kind of creator because of... Uh -huh. um, the beauty of life and the elegance of life. I, I studied biology. And then it was when I finally understood Darwin, I suppose, that, that, I, that I suddenly realized there's absolutely no reason whatsoever. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, the last reason was gone, and then I became an atheist. And then was rather militant and did Wait, things like... Wait, how old like, were you then? About, um, about 17, I, I refused to uh, kneel, kneel down in chapel and things. Oh. So I and two friends used to sort of sit up like this, well... well while everybody else was kneeling down, and we gazed out over this sea of bowed heads. <laughs> felt very superior. <laughs> but, but, but the school was very tolerant. I mean, that, that, there was no discipline about that. I mean, they, they, this was Anglicanism, and so they just, they just we, we could do whatever we liked. Yeah. And, but what did your parents, like, were your parents, they just went on holidays? Well, I, it was I, like a cultural... I didn't know this at the time, but I'm, my mother recently told me, she's 98, my mother recently told me that my housemaster at school actually summoned my parents. Oh, really? At, at, to, to tea, which is what we do in England. And, <laughs> when you're really in trouble. And, and yes, and, <laughs> and actually asked, asked them to um, intervene and to, um, to stop me doing what I was doing. You mean not kneeling? Yes. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and my father said, um, that's your problem. I refuse to have anything to do with it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> talk to you about it like no you just never had a discussion about it like no, you just no they uh, went to tea today well, we won't discuss what happened that, that's i didn't even know they were they'd come to tea i didn't I, um. <laughs> wow okay and so then by the time you were like say 18 were you saying like that you were an atheist yes or, like, oh yeah you just would say that oh yes yes and but, then yeah go ahead but what about you i mean um, I, no, I've, let's I've talk seen, about you no, well okay we'll talk about me again in a minute. <laughs> but but i i don't know how, how many people have seen julia's um letting go of god Oh. Okay. Um, it, it, 
it, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful show, and, and I absolutely adored every minute of it. It sort of stands out in memory. But there must be other stories that, that, didn't, get it, that didn't make the final cut, and which perhaps well, you yes, can share with us. Well, yes, because when I did my show, Letting Go of God, and I did it like I was, you know, 40 years old in L.A. when I first started doing it, or older, I think 45, I don't know, a long time ago. Anyway, <laughs> much older now. Okay, but anyway... Um, and people were surprised. Most of my friends in Hollywood and in show business came and said, the, the, big, the sh most shocking thing about your show is that you were ever religious. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but most people said, you know, I was brought up in a religion when I was about 12. I realized that I didn't believe it anymore. And that was that. That seemed to be the most common thing that happened. And... It was actually true for me also, but so there, there is a story that I didn't put in my show um, about me at about that age, 11, 12. It was not based on science because we really didn't have any science in our school, <laughs> I realize now. Um, it was more like I was sitting in church and I looked up and I had like an epiphany that it was all a lie. Like it was almost like God came to me and told me it was a lie. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> But it felt like that. Like I was just sitting there and I just thought, oh, oh my God, this is all a made up story. Like this whole thing is a big made up story and none of it's true. And it's so obvious it isn't true. But I didn't really have, I wasn't a really, I didn't understand critical thinking and I, I got everything through inspiration. But anyway, I went to, to confession and at that time in Catholicism they were going through a little bit of a liberal time then and they had changed the name of confession to reconciliation and you went into a room with the priest you weren't in the confessional and you sat there with the priest and he had his back to you but you were in the same room and so what you was the idea of having his back to you so he couldn't see your face well they or... actually they started having the <laughs> you face the priest but that was terrible like the priest didn't want to look at you and you didn't want to look at the priest no one there, there needed to be some feeling of anonymity or like you, because it's, the idea is that the priest is just there as a vessel for God to be hearing yeah. you and that they're not really hearing you even though they are and whatever. Okay, so, <laughs> so the first thing was that you looked at the priest and then that was a disaster. And so then they decided the priest would have his back to you. So anyway, they went back to the confessional after uh, about six months of this, but we went through this time at that time. So I went in and... The priest was there with his back to me, and he said, tell me your sins. And I said, you know what? I don't believe it. I think it's all a big lie. I think somebody just made this up, and everyone's just following along. <laughs> and, um, and that was a big deal, because, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't really an iconoclast, and I wasn't that kind of person, and just to say that was a big deal. And then there was a big, long pause, and then I started, started seeing his shoulders go like this, and I thought he was laughing. And that was actually an important moment, because I turned red with embarrassment, like I was being laughed at. And I also suddenly thought, why are you saying that? You don't even have any evidence, and how do you know that? And as soon as I said it, I didn't necessarily believe it anymore. Like I was completely, you know, flooded with emotion and embarrassment. But then I realized that he wasn't laughing, he was crying. Cry crying? Yes, I made a priest cry. Okay, so then... <laughs> and he was crying, and then, and then I heard that he was crying, and that was like a really marked on my memory but why forever. Do you why do you think he was crying? Well, I don't know. He didn't tell me. But he said, get out, just get out. And then I, I ran out of the confessional and I was completely horrified. Like it was such a huge, horrible thing. And I ran into the church. I got on my knees in the first pew. I remember right where I was at St. Augustine's. And I said, dear God, I'm so sorry. Why did I do that? I will never not believe in you again. I will believe in you. I will believe in you. And I was really overwhelmed with that I'd made a priest cry. And then, um, and I just vowed to be even more religious than I ever had been. Like it was a huge, horrible thing. And then Father, the priest left the church. And I, and of course in my egomania, it was like, because I told him there was no God. <laughs> and, and like, and, and then he started coming to our church just as a participant, as a congregant, with the housekeeper of the <laughs> rectory. Barbara, and my mom would say that her father went to Barbara, Barbara, and and then and of course everyone thought, which was probably true, that he left the church to be with Barbara, the housekeeper. But in my mind, it was like, no, it's because I told him that there was. Well, no I God. think I think you were right. No. But I think 
I, I don't know why he was crying. I think he was having a lot of conflict yeah, right I now. Think, I think, <laughs> n- no doubt Barbara helped, but... Yes. but I, <laughs> But I think, I think that you were articulating the doubts that he felt. Yeah, I think he might And, have, yeah. and uh, he, he was driven to despair that, that somebody was actually articulating exactly okay. what he thought. So I, I was... think you deserve the credit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I wonder what happened to him. Well, maybe he joined the clergy project. Yeah, he I, might have. Um, okay, that brings us to the clergy project. Explain well, what the clergy okay, project is. Okay, the clergy is. project. Um, one of the things that the Richard Dawkins Foundation is doing and has done is to um, sponsor a website called the Clergy Project, where clergy people who have lost their faith, like Father, what was his name? Well, it's so funny because if it was in a screenplay, you would say, you can't have a name that on the nose, but his name was Father Weeks. I, I heard, I, I was having dinner with the vicar in, in Oxford a, a few weeks ago, and he said that he had a priest friend who was called Father Christmas. <laughs> true, true. See? True. Anyway, um... Uh, See, if my people, name was Christmas, I would not become a priest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the clergy project would be would be absolutely tailor-made for Father... Was it Leek? No, Weeks. Weeks. Father Weeks. He's weak. Yeah, he's weak. Um, (laughs) But actually, the members of the clergy project are not weak. Um, They are in a terrible bind. Yeah. Because they have committed their lives to a profession in which they no longer believe. And it's not like a farmer giving up farming right. or an engineer giving up engineering because anybody can do that and that's fine. You change your mind, you get new interests, so you change. But if you're a clergy person and you lose your faith, you, you either... I mean, you, you, you have to start living a lie, which is right. what many of them do, um, or you lose everything. You lose your friends, you lose your, your parents, you lose your children, you lose your wife, your husband, or that many of them are at risk of this. So in this w- website that we set up, we made it very, very confidential. They, many of them came in under pseudonyms, under assumed names. Uh, their identity was very strictly protected. And they talked to each other on this website, crying on each other's shoulder, and in some cases, maybe literally crying, I don't know, and encouraging each other, comparing notes, and gradually working themselves up to coming out, which some of them have now done. There are now about 600 uh, clergy people from many different denominations, Christians, Jews, uh, and um, they're steadily, one one by one, coming out and retraining. My original plan was not just to set up this website. If I'd raised a really lot of money, I would have had retraining scholarships so that they could retrain as carpenters or... Like Jesus. Thank you, you got okay, sorry, it. Sorry, <laughs> I always have to say that. Okay. Um, or, or, more, or, or, or as, as um, counsellors or, yes. or, 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 or as teachers. And I mean, some of them have done that. Some of them have, have come out and done that and that. But it's even worse than you're saying because when I did my show, Letting Go of God, I actually got a lot of emails from priests saying, I don't believe, but what am I going to do? And it's... It's even worse because, you know, the priests, they don't even get social security. Like, they, they opt out of that entire, you know, they have a special thing with the government where they are paid and there's no, like, so they can't leave. Like, I, had, I remember one priest saying, you know, I'm 55 years old. Like, what am I supposed yeah. to do now? I can't even, like, I can't go. I mean, I feel I very sorry. I feel very sorry for them. I've got yeah. a, a friend who's much more hard-hearted and said, more fool you for going into it in the first place. But, but I, I actually do feel great, great, great sympathy. Um, there's a book by Dan Dennett and Linda Lascola. Uh, Linda Lascola is a sociologist who did research on these clergy people, doing interview research. And she wrote a book jointly with Dan Dennett, the famous philosopher, about her father. Fi- what they conclude. Has my microphone gone off? No. Okay. But what they conclude about these, these clergy people. And we, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, uh, is sponsoring a play that's based upon 
this book by, that, by Dennett and Lascola. I, I haven't seen the play. The play's not finished yet. Uh, it's being written, and there's been a read-through, which is apparently a great success. Oh, good. Uh, and it's going to be cut down for the actual stage version. So that's another of the enterprises that, um, that we're engaged upon in the, yeah. in the foundation. Um, why don't you just tell a little bit more about what the foundation okay, is? Okay, I mean, there, there are those two things. Another one is uh, sponsoring school productions of the play Inherit the Wind. Um, There's a famous film of Inherit the Wind as well with Spencer Tracy and, 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 and others. Um, but it's a play, and we are sponsoring 90 schools to put on productions of this play. It's about the Scopes Monkey Trial, of which the, it's the 90th anniversary of the Scopes Monkey Trial, so that's why the, why the 90 schools. And it's a, it's a wonderful play and very educational. Uh, it's fictional. It's, a, the, it's firmly based upon the Scopes Monkey Trial, but, but with the characters' names ch uh -huh. changed. Um, th so that's another thing we're doing. Another thing we're doing is um, subtitling our, all our YouTube videos, of which there are a large number, in other languages, especially Arabic and Urdu and the languages where perhaps it's needed most. And finally, the most important thing we're doing is the Openly Secular campaign. You, you already know about that because you saw uh, Julia's wonderful contribution to that. Um, the Openly Secular campaign is an attempt to get people to come out and proclaim to the world that they are atheist or secular. And this is so important because in America, uh, it's still an enormous numbers of people are in the closet with respect to this. It's, it's rather like the gay movement was 20 years ago, when to be gay was, some, was something you had to keep, keep quiet about, they were a bit of a pariah. Now that's all changed. The gay movement has been spectacularly successful in uh, persuading people to treat gay people as human, the human beings that they are. So we're trying to do the same thing. And so we're trying to get not just celebrities like Julia uh, and Bill Maher and Penn and Teller and people, we're also getting ordinary people to make short YouTube videos of themselves, YouTube selfies, where they say, I am a fireman, I'm a policeman, I'm a nurse, I'm a school teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, uh, and I'm openly secular. And I'm obviously a nice person. You can see it looking in my face, I don't say that, but, but that's... <laughs> But so if you don't look like a nice person, don't you do don't it. want yes. them. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, we, need, we, need, we, we need nasty people as well. But, 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 <laughs> um, so uh, can, can I encourage everybody to, to do that? Uh, and once a sufficient number of people do it, then it will reach a tipping point, and then the floodgates will open, as they did with gay people. And uh, so that's the, that, I suppose, is the main thing. Uh, that, we're, that we're doing, the Openly Secular Campaign. Uh, the Openly Secular Campaign has its own website, which you, which you can go and look at. Now, where, I just thought of this, but where do you come down on this spiritual thing? Because I feel like, we were talking about this for a second backstage, but in LA, people would come up to me and say, oh, I'm an atheist, but uh, what sign are you? And you've got to oh, go to the psychic that I know. And so... I realize that, at least in Los Angeles and in the entertainment community, there were all these people who were not religious, but they were just as much um, filled with superstition and, you know, had... Oh, it, it, and yeah. it was so crazy. I'd almost rather they were Catholic. Than, you know. <laughs> I know! I agree with that, because I feel like, wait a minute, I guess I get worried about... Like, in some ways... Religion allows people to keep all of their crazy superstitions in one manageable place. Yes, that's right. <laughs> like, you know, like... Um, that's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> um, because I feel like with people, if they don't have good critical thinking skills and don't understand the fundamentals of science, um, and, and not even deep science, just understanding that they don't have to have superstition, for example, or that psychics aren't real... Um, they gravitate towards all, like, I think it's a natural part of our brain architecture to just gravitate in the absence of knowledge towards coming up with answers of why things exist, and most of those answers have, 
are often most easily answered by superstitions and yeah. crap. And in LA, it's just rampant. And it made me so crazy. I felt the same. I'd rather be around a Catholic than a New Age person. Well, let me tell you that uh, <laughs> my wife, Lala Ward, who was an actress, t- told me this story. She was in a film um, directed by the famous director Otto Preminger. And uh, he was Austrian. And um, he was approached by a young starlet on this film. And she said, oh, gee, Mr. Preminger, what sign are you? (laughs) And he said, I am a do not disturb sign. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I think it's, it's, it's very sad that people are... It, it suggests that if they become atheists, it's for the wrong reasons. It's for the non, right. it's for non-critical reasons. I, and, and I think it's, it's very sad. We need to unite all our critical faculties. Um, you talked about Catholics keeping all their beliefs in one place. We should, we should focus our critical beam right. on, on, um, a, on everything, including religion, including homeopathy, including psychics and spiritualists and, and things. Not that I'm against the word spiritual if used carefully. Okay, I mean, yeah, that's what I, I want to I hear. Dare, I dare say Carl Sagan would have called himself spiritual. But he would have or not? I don't know. I mean, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise right. me in the, in the same sense I would myself. I mean, yeah. you, you, do, you do get a, a feeling, a sort of tightening in the throat when you, when you look up at the stars. You, you, feel, right. you feel just moved in a poetic way. And there's no, absolutely no reason why we as scientists and atheists shouldn't be poetic. I hope we are. I mean, I think science is a, is a wonderful vehicle for poetry. Uh, but it should never stray into superstition, supernaturalism. Well, I used to really hold on to the word spiritual. Like, I would say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. There was many years that I said that. And then a lot of people, because I was going to a lot of atheist conventions and secular things, and they were really challenging me on using that word since it has you know religious roots and and then i was saying but in the you know common parlance people don't take it that way and i think i can still use this word but then i went to the other side and now i avoid that word because i try to just i actually sat and came up with words you know like i actually made a list of words that i would try to go to instead of spiritual like i would say that was a profound experience or i felt great awe or like I really tried to avoid it because I think even though I think it's fine that people use whatever words they want I don't I'm not in the word police or anything like that but I feel like that's an interesting thing because people like to say they're spiritual they're it, I, I guess what they're saying is that they're open to the artistic profound view yeah. of the world and they like to use that word but I actually am trying to not use that word. I think you're me. right because it's a, it's a word that's almost begging to be misunderstood. Right. There, there are people out there who are actually eager to misunderstand. I mean, right. we, we saw that eagerness in the case of, well, Einstein for example. Ein, Einstein uh, you liked to use the word God even, let alone sp- right. spiritual. Of course he didn't mean God. Um, what right. Einstein meant was that which we don't understand. So when Einstein wanted to say that he, what he really wanted to know was, is there only one way for a universe to be? Is there only one kind of universe? D- did the universe have to be the way it is, or could there have been other universes? He said, what I really want to know is, did God have a choice in creating the universe? Well, that was his way of saying, right. is there more than one way for a universe to be? But needless to say, using the word God like that is just... Asking to be misunderstood. And so Einstein has been eagerly embraced by religious people who like to Oh, I know. It makes me crazy. They go, even Einstein believed in God. It's like, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. (laughs) Um, and, and and, um, Although, okay, but then on the other hand, I feel like God is such a useful metaphor. Like, I retain the right to use God as a metaphor. Because... Even in science, I know it's very useful to say, well, what does it want to do? Or this, you know, like looking at biology, like if you imagine a force or a design or why it's a certain way, like it's so easy to let that idea of God come in and it can be really useful, but it's so misinterpreted. So I guess you just have to yes, be careful. Yes, what, what would be an example of that though? I mean, apart from... Well, you could say, like, the blood cells want oxygen. You know, like... You oh, would, that's fine. I you mean, know what I mean? Yeah, like, you're, yes. like, like, my husband's a scientist, and he... I often hear 
Like, he ascribes motives to things that, of course, don't have motives, but it's just a useful way oh, of talking. Yes, that, that's hardly got... I mean, I, I was once at a posh conference in Germany where I met the molecular biologist Jacques Monod, Nobel Prize winner, and he said, uh, when I'm faced with a problem like this, I say to myself, what would I do if I was an electron? Yes. That, that, and <laughs> physi um, physicists do it as well. Uh, if you... If you're try you know the phenomenon of, of refraction, where a beam of light gets bent when it, hits when it comes out of air into glass. Um, right. Well, what the light beam is doing is m uh, minimizing the time it takes to get to the other, to the other end. Yes. Well, the metaphor of the selfish gene is sometimes misunderstood as genes being conscious little devils. Um, uh, <laughs> scientists, on the whole, don't misunderstand it. Philosophers sometimes do. I'm very sorry to say. Um, now, Richard, when, tell me when you decided to spend so much, what was the reason that you really decided to turn your um, energies towards spreading the word of there is no God? Well, I don't think there's, <laughs> there's much difference, really. I mean, I think it's all part of the scientific enterprise. Uh, I, I'm passionate about truth. Uh, and I suppose particularly as an evolutionary biologist, we biologists are in a way in the frontline trench because the, the, we bear the brunt of religious hostility to science. Physicists do a, a bit with respect to the Big Bang, but biologists really, really do uh, with respect to evolution. So I felt there was almost no choice but to uh, fight against at, at least the religiously er erroneous view of science and uh, I suppose I could have stopped there and uh, not attacked those more sensible religious people who accept evolution and accept science, but somehow want to inject a sort of spiritual dimension into it. And th that I, I don't, I mean, that does strike me as, as dishonest as well, and so I, 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 I go for that too. But I've never thought of it as a, as a sudden discontinuity in my life, changing from, from science to to, to religion. I, I always regarded it as part of the same enterprise. And actually, all, all my books take kind of side swipes at religion, and, and then the God delusion does it, does it in a more full frontal way. But do you ever feel, do you ever get tired of it? Like, do you ever want to retreat to a lab or...? Well, not really. <laughs> I, um, I, I suppose it's true that, I, that I, 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 I don't do lab coat research now, and Occasionally, I do miss it, but uh, I, I wasn't all that good at it. And, <laughs> really? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I wasn't bad, but, 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 I, I, but I sort of feel that I probably had more impact on the world by writing books. And um, if I'd devoted my life to doing research and publishing papers in journals, that would have been nice. But uh, I don't regret doing what I, what I have done. It's like, you, it's like you discovered the memes, and then you became a meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, when we were in the, in yes. the Greek green room, yes. you told me a lovely story about nuns on the bus, which I hadn't heard oh. before. <laughs> well, I was just saying that I feel optimistic about the future, even though it seems like some religions, particularly Islam, is having a bigger resurgence of, of fundamentalism, and it seems like it might be going backward, you could say. Um, overall, I feel like their humanity as a whole and the earth as a whole, things are getting better. And I really feel like this new pope is making things a lot better for, for Catholics. And I disagree with a lot of things that he says, and, I, and fundamentally I don't believe the same things he believes, but um, I really like what he's doing. So the example that I was giving, because my family's Catholic, so it's a lot of Catholic stuff, but um, there's these nuns that are real progressive and they get out there and they, you know, strike and they bring attention to income inequality. That's their main focus is trying to help the poor and, and fight legislation that is making income inequality worse and things worse off for poor people. And they've said, made statements, and there's one sister that's sort of the head of it, but they've made statements like, you know, birth control is not, really shouldn't be the issue, that's not important. What's important is poor people and how everything's rigged against them, and that's their fight. And the last pope 
didn't like this group of women and had made a statement saying that they were not following the precepts of the Catholic Church, they should spend more of their time on sexuality and keeping, you know, like staying in the convent basically, and then he appointed some archbishop in the U.S. to be in charge of them, and it was like, and my aunts, who are all very Catholic but very progressive Catholics, were enraged by this, so then they were out protesting on behalf of the whim of the nuns on the bus. And then the new pope, as soon as he was in office, like a couple months later, he said, no, the nuns on the bus are doing the right thing. The nuns on the bus are saying the right, they're fighting for the right causes. And then I went and saw the nun on the bus a couple weeks ago, give the main nun give a speech, and she was really great. And it really made me think, it made me just feel hopeful. Like, I feel like even though I understand intellectually the argument that moderate Christians or moderate religious people in some ways are more heinous, that you could say, than fundamentalists because they're sort of partaking in the modern world, but then, and, and, but they're still grabbing onto their religion. I feel like there's a progression. Like, I think it's better to have religions that accept um, maybe more progressive ideals or science, and I feel like the, this pope is doing that. I mean, not in every case, but in, mo in many cases, and I feel really hopeful about yeah. it. And I feel that just the, all the numbers that we're talking about, that we're hearing about here, like 25% or whatever of the U.S. saying that they're, they're also nuns, not nuns on the bus. They're none for religion. Um, but I feel like that's very hopeful, too. I, I just feel like, I just feel very hopeful about the whole yeah. thing. Let me inject a slight note of cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Um, well, a, a, a few years ago in, in Oxford, I attended a, a lecture by a nun, and she was very progressive. Uh, she didn't, uh, she was uh, pro-abortion, she was pro-contraception. Um, in fact, she was against absolutely everything in the Catholic Church. <laughs> um, and she got a rousing reception from the Oxford students, so she was a great hero. And then I, I thought, yes, she's saying all these wonderful liberal things. But why is she still a Catholic? And I, then I realized that this is her meal ticket. I mean, if she, if she, if she wasn't a nun, she would have been the, saying the same thing as everybody else in the room. It's because she was a nun that they that, thought it was I think remarkable. That is a little cynical. It is cynical. And, and I'm, I'm, um, but, but I think there's a dilemma. Your, your point is a, is a very good one, which is that you, you, you would like to see, in a way, the church subverted from within by liberal yes. nuns and things. And you could argue the opposite way, which is, why don't they just walk? Why don't they just get out? Well, dessert? because this brings up a bigger topic, Richard. Yeah. I don't know if you're ready to go there. Okay. But I feel like religion provides a lot more than dogma and stories. It provides community and ritual and history and music. And I mean, I... I've come to believe that the people who are Catholics that I know aren't in the Catholic Church because of a set of beliefs. They're in the Catholic Church because this is their culture. It's almost like being Irish or something. It's this part of their culture and, and it gives their life meaning. And so I would say that nun is, finds her meaning in the Catholic Church, even though she disagrees yeah. with much of what the Catholic Church on the record believes in. Yes, but they are swelling the statistics, they're, 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 they, they, they don't actually believe it, but they're, they're recorded on censuses and polls and things as Catholic. Right. And so they swell the apparent numbers of people who are in the church, which the church then uses um, as ammunition. Say, so look, we have so and so many million people in the world who are Catholic, and they then use it as propaganda in their mission to, um, to stop contraception in Africa, to, to, to stop condoms in Africa, uh, and so on. So in a way, those people who are not really believers, but allow themselves to be counted in the, the totals of Catholics, mm -hmm. are in a way betraying something, because they're, they're, they're being used as a, as a head count. I suppose that's the kind of thing I'm thinking. Well, I, I agree with you. But I would say that it's most, transformation I really think is more likely to happen from within. Yeah. I really do. Yes. I, like, I actually encourage people who are in religions to stay in the religion but say that you're atheist. Because, for example, um, I mean, not everyone, that's not for everyone, but <laughs> when... <laughs> well, what no, does it but, mean to stay in the religion then? You, it, well, like, okay, 
you know where I get it from? The Jews. Yeah. yeah. Because okay. I have so many friends who are Jewish and they're atheists. They say they're atheists. They've always said they're atheists. Their family has always said they're atheists, but they still do Passover and they still participate in the rituals. But they, and they might go to synagogue on the high holidays or something, but they're atheists and they're not afraid to say it. And I feel like, you know, you could say that's hypocritical, but you could also say sort of honoring a tradition that has helped the people alive and yeah. is part of their history. I get that. I get and that. I wish, I feel like Catholicism is ripe for that because I think within Catholicism, there's just people saying, oh, I'm an atheist, but I'm, you know, culturally Catholic yeah. and I still well, participate. Well, I, I say that. I mean, I, I say I'm, a, I'm an atheist, but culturally. Uh, Anglican sometimes, and and yeah. and you know, I go I go to carol service in King's College, Cambridge, and, and th things. <laughs> I think it's are, harder are, with more fundamentalist religions. Yes, but I do worry about the betrayal aspect when you when when you actually say you're. I mean, I I don't say I'm I'm, I'm Anglican. I say I'm culturally Anglican occasionally. Right. But I, I I wouldn't I would never tick the Anglican box in a in a census form, uh, which. I, I'm guessing that some of the Jewish atheists you're talking about would actually tick, tick Jewish. Um, yeah, well, that but, one's complicated too because it is an ethnicity yeah. also. But I just feel I've I've really changed my thinking over the last few years and thinking more things should be happening from within than without. Because I think there's a certain type of personality that can leave the church, but I think that's not. There's more people who probably could be persuaded that the myths that they're belief system is based on our myths, but will stay, then there is people who are willing to actually leave. Yes. And I think if you make it more okay for those people to say, oh yeah, that's just a myth, and just acknowledge that, I just think that change will happen better that way. I, I, that's a debatable point. You could very well be right. I, I was talking one time to an ex-Muslim uh, who clearly was an, was, was an atheist, but went on saying she was a Muslim. So I said, well, why, why do you go on saying she, you're a Muslim? She didn't say because I don't want to have my head cut off. Um, <laughs> she said, because I, because I think I can do more good from within. Yes. It's exactly the point you're, you're, you're making. And I mean, that's, it's definitely a very, a very plausible point. I, I'm not sure how, you dis, how we decide which was the best way to go. Well, I think it's in every way. I mean, I've, that's how my personal view of the whole atheist movement has been there's room for every kind of voice. Yeah. Like, I feel like you are saying what you're saying. I don't agree with everything. Maybe not be, I wouldn't be as strident or as negative about religion, but there's, there's definitely Which, place which of us that. sounds more strident? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, and I think there's room for, like, Sam Harris to say what he's saying. Like, I think all these voices, there's room for all these voices. Like, I agree. there's, there's I agree. like a big rainbow yeah. of people. I agree, I agree. And I agree. they're all their opinions. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I was once asked by the independent newspaper in, in London uh, to contribute to a, a, a weekly column they had called Heroes and Villains. And you had to choose either a hero or a villain to, to write a short article ab about them. So I chose. Pope John Paul II as hero, uh, and obviously the joke is in the paradox. And I said, um, I said that um, he's a hero because he is uh, uh, the, the best possible advertisement for this terrible institution of which he's the head. Um, and uh, if, if people go on um, following him, this will this will hasten the destruction of the Catholic Church. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, he's my hero. And, um, <laughs> And would you believe it, some wretched sub-editor changed the, the, the headline from Richard Dawkins on his hero, Pope John Paul II. Richard Dawkins on the dubious heroism of, of Pope John Paul II, totally killing the joke. <laughs> um, and I, I'm doing a sort of one-man campaign against sub-editors of newspapers um, <laughs> who write headlines which, which the author of the article never sees and has no idea about. Oh, I know. And I've simply no, lost terrible. count of the number of times when authors have waited with bated breath and seen their article and every word is correct, except the sodding headline, which, <laughs> right. which completely ruins it. No. It happens again and again and again. I just had that happen to me. I mean, yeah. it's on a much smaller level, but I did an interview with Salon about my experiences at SNL and going to SNL 40, and it was like... 
99% positive. My feeling was so happy about it. I had such a good time, blah, blah, blah. And then she was asking me, and she was great, but she asked me something about, you know, I said something like, well, at some point it became more of a sort of old boy network with Adam Sandler and Rob Schneider. I, I said something, it wasn't, but, and then I said, even though I love those guys and they're really funny. And the headline was, Julia Sweeney finally spills the beans about the old boy network oh, at SNL. Okay. And I was so angry yes, about it. And, yeah. and actually the woman who wrote the article wrote to me and apologized for it. Because it wasn't her Because it wasn't even her. No, it wasn't her. Yeah, it's just strange. But I mean, I just remembered a, a similar story of mine. I wrote a, a book review of a book by a genuine hero, uh, Peter Medawa, a brilliant Nobel Prize winning scientist. And the book review was full of praise for the book, but it had one sentence which said, some people have described Peter Medawa as a loose cannon. And I absolutely repudiate this, it's not a loose cannon because, and I went on about why, why he wasn't. Came out, the headline was shots from a loose cannon. Uh, so I stormed around to the, to the office and spoke to the editor, who it turned out wasn't responsible. This was Redmond O'Hanlon. Have any of you read any of Redmond O'Hanlon's travel books? They're, do, do. I mean, they're so funny. <laughs> he's a, he's a, an explorer who goes intrepidly to the most godforsaken, I almost said, um, uh, <laughs> places on, on Earth. Um, and, um, so you use his, God as a metaphor. Yeah, okay. And he... Um, his, his, his house and his office are full of stuffed monkeys and cat's paws and, and, and various monuments to anthropology and anthropophagy and, and just wonderful curios. And so I bawled him out for about 10 minutes about this, about this headline, Shots from a Loose Cannon. And he listened in complete silence. And then he left the room and he came back and handed me an object. It was a shotgun. <laughs> which completely disarmed me, as you could imagine. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to ask you, I've thought of this, if you, like, I feel like religion can cause people to be better. Like, I, I feel like they, there is, there are positive things to come from religion. They can make people more noble or more self-sacrificing and more giving. Um, and do you think that it's worth it in your mind, to have people be part of a religion, if they're going to be better people, if the myths that that religion is based on are being told that they're true? Like, does, yeah. does the fact that it's not true just negate any good thing that religion does, or for you, or what? Well, let's, let's try to analyze why it might make people better people. Um, I can immediately think of two possible reasons that might be suggested. One is that they feel that they're being watched. Uh, so m many, of right. us, many of us will do good things if, if, if other people are watching us because we right. like to be thought, thought well of. But if nobody's watching us, then uh, maybe we, we won't be so good. So one could make the case that people are good because they feel there's a kind of invisible spy camera mm -hmm. in the sky looking at them. Um, I suppose that's possible. Um, yeah, that is, that is possible. I don't think it's a very noble reason to be good. Uh, I think I would res have more respect for somebody who's good because they really want to be good rather than because they want to impress either a person or a god. Mm -hmm. um, so, although I concede that it might be possible that people are better because they're frightened of God, but that's not the only reason. No, no, I mean, I'd I suggest mean, that that's, 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 one, that's reason. one reason. Another reason might be, uh, it might be suggested that they're good because they've read the Ten Commandments. Well, that's a bad... Which thing. is a terrible reason. <laughs> so those are um, not good commandments. If you've actually read the Ten Commandments, <laughs> when they're hung up in the courthouse in Texas, whatever it is, I wonder whether the people who agitate for them have actually ever read the Ten Commandments um, or the, maybe they read the Sermon on the Mount, which is a lot better. Right, that is. Um, that, that's, that's genuinely good. Um, you can find verses in Holy Scripture, in the Bible and the Quran, which uh, admonish you to be good. You can find them if you look really hard, uh, like the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find a hell of a lot more verses that are simply terrible in their moral 
uh, persuasions. Um, so you have to make a, you have to choose which verses to fo to follow, and the criterion by which you choose, by definition, is non-scriptural. I mean, you're you're choosing among the verses which ones are good ones, and you're using a criterion of choice. You choose the Sermon on the Mount because. It, by the standards of 21st century morality, it's very good. You don't choose almost anything in the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Numbers or Exodus um, because by the standards of 21st century morality, they're terrible. But note the standards of 21st century morality. We have moved on dramatically. We are now much, much better people than we were a century ago, two centuries mm -hmm. ago, three centuries ago. Beautifully documented by Steven Pinker in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which I strongly recommend. Um, we are getting far more humane, uh, far more decent, far less cruel, um, and it's all for non-religious reasons. It's all something mysterious that goes on from century to century, even from decade to decade. Uh, and with hindsight, you can look back at your religious scriptures and find the verses which are in accord with 21st century morality and reject the verses that are not, but you're not using religious or scriptural criteria to make that discrimination. So I would reject both those two main reasons why, why religious people might be thought to be better. Um, maybe I mean, there are my, others, maybe there are others. My feeling is I, I started doing this thing about five years ago where I started going to different churches every Sunday. I was going to do this church project where I was going to go to, it was going to be a year of Sundays, or I, every Sunday I was going to go to a different church and write about it. And I never, I kept notes on every church I went to, but I didn't write the book because I'm a terrible procrastinator. But anyway, but I continued doing the church project. Like I just, and I still do it. I still go on Sunday. And, and I think it's fantastic. You can just walk into almost any church and you can sit down. And my feeling after all of this is there isn't that much fire and brimstone amongst the churches I went to. It's really like, be a better person. We're all here. We're all vulnerable. We need each other. I mean, like, that's pretty much the sermon. It's like, it's not really that much about from the Bible. It's really, and I do feel inspired often by the sermons. Like, I feel like this is a good thing. You know, people in the neighborhood are here. They're getting together. Let's be better people. There's like a food drive. There's this in the basement. Well, maybe we should all know? do that. I mean, maybe we don't need, need to be religious to do that. Maybe we should all get together. Right. Well, I, I'm starting to feel that way. Because I feel like, I guess for me, my big epiphany is I was religious. I liked being Catholic. It worked for me to a certain extent. I had what I thought was a religious experience even. Um, and then I looked into it and found out that it was all based on, you know, terrible science and not true stories. And then that made me reject the whole thing. And now I'm in this new phase where I feel like, you know what? Like when I told my mother that I wasn't going, you know, like I didn't believe anymore. And she sort of laughed at me and said, I said something like, I'm an atheist now. And she said something like, that doesn't mean you're going to stop going to church, does it? And, <laughs> and I realize now that that actually wasn't a funny thing because it is kind of true. I'm starting to think from doing my church wanderings that people don't even go to church based on what they believe. No, they well, go to church for all kinds of other reasons and they're not bad reasons. They're reasons about getting together with the community I mean, they can have bad, definitely, I b agree with all the bad stuff, but there's also a lot of good stuff. And I, like when I first became an atheist and I went to all the atheist conventions, you know, I was in my strident phase. I was in my, oh, I can't believe how untrue this is and how did people tell me things that were so obviously untrue and that they must have known were untrue. That, I was so outraged by that. But now I think... Whether it's true or not, you know, it's like, it doesn't really, that's actually the least interesting thing about religion. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. I, I really, <laughs> I uh, do okay, Julia, think that. Let, let me have another go at, at um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me have another go at the thing about, about treachery. Um, all these people you're talking about, they don't really believe, but they, 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 they go to church they are counted 
as members of this church or that church. Politicians in this country will look at statistics and they will say, some very high percentage of the American population is Christian. Therefore, I've got to say, um, whatever it is they say, God bless America, when at the end of right. the speech. Yeah, no, I think um, that is bad. And, I agree, that's and not there good. Is, there is a widespread belief that anybody who is not a believer cannot get elected to high office in, in, uni in the United yeah. States. And th that what, what you're, in, you're in effect agreeing with me that actually that's a myth because the people who go to church are in many cases not actually believers. And you're saying, well, it doesn't matter if it's true. They go to church to have a good time and to have tea no, and not biscuits. not to have a good time, um, but to have a... Well, okay. Saying a good time is not but, fair. But the, but the point is that they are perpetuating the myth that America is a religious country, and therefore politicians yes, have to... Have I to agree. There are some side things that happen from that that are not good, and that is one of them. Being counted amongst the groups and having politicians cater to what they believe people want based on numbers is bad. But I also think things can be changed from within. I mean, there's, there's many religions that are changed from within by the changing beliefs of the congregation. And so it works both ways, I but, think. But when will it reach the point where a politician will no longer have to pretend to be religious? For the 535 members of U.S. Congress, and a very substantial number of them have got to be lying when they say they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're religious. And I don't blame them for lying. They have to lie or they won't get elected. I don't blame them for lying. But the reason they're lying is that they've been persuaded that the majority of the American population is, is religious. And people who follow your idea are helping to perpetuate that myth. Yes, I, I, yes, I agree. That's a bad thing. But I don't think it's so bad they shouldn't go. Okay, but... Because well, I think there's other good things that come from it. Well, we, we could have a sort of... I mean, there's, there, there is an atheist church in, in England um, where people go uh, and they have a... It is not a sermon, it's a kind right. of, I don't know, a lecture or poetry reading or musical encounter or something of that sort, um, which I'd be all in favor of. So a long musical as they, encounter or so, something so long, of that sort. So long as, they don't, <laughs> so long as they're not actually counted right. as, as, as religious, I'd be all in favor of that. I think it would be great. I mean, the, I, I know you're kind of flirting with the Unitarian Church, and, yes. and that would be absolutely fine if it wasn't counted in statistics as a religion. Because um, what, you're, what you're saying is that the Unitarian Church is doing all the right things, except they don't actually believe in God. And, and, but well, that's part of the right thing they're doing. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes. Right, but it is true. They get lumped in with religion. It is true. Yes. But I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways to change. And I think from within is one way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should throw this. Yes, I think we need to ask for questions. <laughs> for questions. Can we have the, the house lights up so we can see? We want to look at you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hello. Um, so um, I, uh, I came here with, a, with a two fulcrums from which I was going to ask the question. And one was Rupert Sheldrake and the other one was John Shelby Spong. But given the, 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 the tenor of the discussion, I'm going to go with John Shelby Spong. Because there was so much discussion about what might it take for existing religious expression to uh, transform itself. And the reason why um, the focus is on John Shelby Spong is, is uh, for whom I'm assuming you have some familiarity with his work. Um, he's a, he's a an Episcopal bishop who he's essentially, he's written books Sorry, like... Who, 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 what, what was the name again? John Shelby Spong. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got okay, you're familiar with his work. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so you're then aware that, that he, uh, in, he is an atheist in that he does not accept the, the theism upon which most uh, religious practice is based. He also refers to religion as a cultural experience, in, which is yes. very along the lines that you mentioned. So... The question really becomes, um, is that an exemplar? Is that a path through which we can retain the, uh, the value that arises out of that cultural expression that we've called religion and, 
uh, like a chrysalis, you know, um, uh, remove that that sort of theism that is really a distortion of that of 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 what we understand to be God. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, um, I think this is a fascinating question, and and it it really raises exactly the issue that yeah, we've been right. we've been talking about. And I I may have sounded more strident than I meant to, because I think that Bishop John Shelby Spong is a, is a, obviously an extremely good man. I, I've met him. I've had dinner with him, uh, and he's an extremely nice man. Um, how you can say your, I mean, if I don't think he actually says he's an atheist, but but he he probably is. He says atheist. Um, uh, That's great. I I really don't don't get how you can go on being a bishop. Um, and but uh, Ju Julia would say that's great because you're subverting yes. it from within. And that, I think. I know. Um, uh, I mean, there's a similar man in Scotland, B Bishop Richard Holloway, who ended up, I think, head of the Church of Scotland or something like that, um, and he too is pretty much an atheist. He calls himself a recovering Christian. Um, uh, and I've had, I think, three, um, I hardly call them debates, I mean, similar encounters with, with Bishop Holloway on the stage in, in Edinburgh. And um, he's another extremely good man, a, de a delightful m man. And it's really not clear what, what he's doing, but it looks as though there's a, at least a strand of opinion that, right. that, that Julia represents, which, which is that you can do a lot of good by subverting the church from within. And uh, maybe we need both ways of doing it. I've really come to that. I feel like what you're doing is great. I think that like, what they're doing is great. I think it's all part of this whole shift of humanity. I, I do. And I think like even that clergy project, I feel like those priests who just say, I'm an atheist. But here I am. I'm your, also your priest. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think that would be great. Up there? Oh. Someone up there. Up, up, way up here in the, in the heavens. Yes. Uh, I, two, two quick, two quick, one point, one question. Uh, first, the, the point is, well, you talked about the, the um, use of the term spirituality as being leading to misinterpretation. Um, and as a qualifier, I have to say, I'm not an atheist, I'm an agnostic. It's between me and whatever I think. I don't care what you think. But spirituality doesn't bother me, but when you mention that right after that, that you can use the term, what does this gene want to do in the terms of Darwinism, I think that leads to way more, it opens up way more misconceptions and misuse than the term spirituality. Um, a gene doesn't want to do anything. It does what it does because it doesn't have a choice. Yes, it is very and, important to understand that the gene doesn't actually want it, anything. And, 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 and it, bo um, it, it bothers me a lot when people I talk to say, well, why did this do that? Why did it do it? There is no why. It did it because... Yeah. Why do we breathe oxygen? Because yes. that's what we I mean, have. It, it's very important to get, to get the point that it is, it is only a metaphorical way of doing it. It, it is a way of getting the, the, the right it, answer. And the, the alternative might be that instead of saying, why does the, why does the gene do what it, the, the gene does what it wants to do in order to get propagated, um, if you're studying lions or studying elephants or studying jellyfish or something, the alternative might be to say, why does the, what, what, what's the lion trying to do? It, well, and that's and it, what biologists have done for a long time. Yes, and, and what you just said, why does the gene, what if does you, the gene want? If you want? say what does the, what, what what does does the, the gene lion? want to do, the gene doesn't want to do anything. It does I, what it I does. I get your point. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but then the, the other one, and, and I'm not sure if let, this is... Let me just answer that, please. Okay. Um, for, for, for many years, people would have said the equivalent, which would be, what is the lion trying to do? And that's much more tempting because the lion is an obvious agent. It's got a brain, it's got limbs, it's got, it's got muscles, it's got nerves. Uh, and it really is obviously trying to do something. But if you actually work out in Darwinian terms what the lion is trying to do, it's doing something very complicated. It's not trying to survive or only trying to survive as a means to the end of passing on its genes. Not even just to reproduce. It's in, that includes... 
uh, helping the genes of other relatives other than offspring, nephews and nieces, brothers and sisters. So you get the right answer if you switch your, the focus of your attention to the gene and say, what is the gene trying to do? You've obviously got to accept the point you're making, which is that the gene isn't literally trying to do anything. How could it? It's only DNA. Um, it, the temptation with the lion is much greater because the lion has a brain. The lion really is trying to catch an antelope. But to do your Darwinism, if you, if you do your metaphorical teleology and say, what is the gene trying to do? You get exactly the right answer because you take in all the nephews and nieces, the grandchildren. Whereas if you, if you try to say, what's the lion trying to do? The answer is the lion is trying to maximize a very complicated mathematical function which amounts to trying to preserve its genes. And so teleology at the gene level works absolutely fine just so long as you can get over the hurdle of realizing that, of course, it's not really trying to do anything, but it's as if it was trying to do something. Then you get the right answer. The mathematics becomes much more simple. Oh, this is why I love Richard Dawkins. That answer. God, I love that. That was so eloquent and great. Who's got the mic? We're not in control. Uh, whoever's got the mic, speak. I didn't think the mic people were going to come in this area at all. Uh, hi, Rach Richard. Um, part of what you guys were talking about at the end there, you were, you were saying how people who continue to go to church but not, might not believe everything are giving people, um, mis giving people the impression that America is a religious society. Part of my question to you is, well, to who? And if, because it seems to be, you're, you, you cited politicians as one example, um, which was leading to how a politician can't come out and say, I don't believe in God. Um, part of this feels to me like um, when somebody like myself comes out as gay to family and friends, and then I run into all these people that are closeted and I say, you're doing a disservice to the rest of us openly gay people by not coming out. It, it feels like there's a very similar parallel to that with, with what you're saying. Can you comment on that at all and elaborate? I guess part of me really wants to hear you talk something about how there could be some good that comes out of religion too because some people might just be emulating Jesus in their own mind. They might be saying, well, Jesus loved everybody and you know, gave to the poor and, and whatnot like that. So that could be some good that comes out of religion as well. But I kind of hear a very staunch opposition to that and talking about the motives of, the, you know, well, actually, they're just afraid. So they're doing good doesn't really matter. Does the motive really count in that case? I don't know what that question I, is. I, I only heard part of that. Well, uh, I only heard part of it, but, and it was to you, not me. But yet, I'm going to say something. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good point. Like, if people are staying well, what, can in you the say closet... What the point was? Well, I mean, the beginning of what he, he was saying was that some people are, were gay, and they came out, and that had a big, profound effect on the people that knew them. And then there were other people that were in the closet, and they... And the, the person who was out was saying, well, you're, you're doing a disservice by being in the closet to people like me. Like, the more people who come out of the closet, the more acceptable it will be. So that's sort of a parallel. Yeah. I was thinking to staying in a religion and, not, and secretly not believing, but being part of this religion. It's not helpful for the truth to come out about how things are, is what I think. Okay, yeah. Which I agree, but I don't think that you should pretend to believe. I think you should just say you don't believe, but you're still part of the church. That's my personal okay. feeling. I mean, uh, perhaps I should, should add that, that um, one of the things that happened in, in, the, in the gay coming out was that people would out other people. Right. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's a, quite a wicked thing to do, actually. Um, and I, and we're the, the openly secular campaign is most emphatically not in the business of outing people. Um, we're in the business of trying to consciousness raise right. and encourage people to come out of their own accord, recognizing that in many cases it can be extremely difficult 
uh, because of the, the pushback that you get, well, worse than pushback, that you get from family and communities and things. Yeah. Um. Hi, Richard. It's my turn right here. Where are you? Oh, I'm in the front. <laughs> Very you... short and to the point. What are your thoughts of the rise of Scientology in America? Is it rising? After that documentary, is uh, it rising? I thought it was going away. Like, actually, I thought they only had 50,000 members now, actual members. I'm curious where they get their money from. I mean, they seem to, they seem to be... Well, because they extorted money from people for so long, they've built it up. Like, Hollywood is completely overrun. Uh, the real estate. Well, yes. Anyway, don't get me started on the Scientologists. Yes. <laughs> it, what, what's bizarre about it is, is that it, it's even more recent than Mormonism. And you, so you, you, you can see the whole development of the whole thing. It was started by... Um, Oh, I've forgotten his name. Um, L. Ron Hubbard. Ro L and it's twice as crazy. L it is L. Ron so Hubbard. crazy. Um, but, but the thing about L. Ron Hubbard was that he, he honestly said, this is how I'm going, to, I'm going to make my fortune, by starting a fake religion. Um, and people still fell for it. Uh, it's just money for old rope. Um, I mean, J Joseph Smith did it in the 19th century, and he was a, a known fake, an, an, a known charlatan. Right. And he invented it all. And yet, th there are thousands of Mormons today who, who just seem incapable of seeing through this obvious mountebank um, with golden tablets, which he uh, translated not even into 19th century English, but into 16th century English. And what's that about? <laughs> um, I mean, it's just got fake written all, all, all over it. And... Um, it, I mean, it, it's, it's just that those two churches, Scientology and Mormonism, are, are recent, and so it's kind of more obvious that they're, right. that they're, they're fake. But doesn't it seem like what Scientology shows me is that people are just going to believe in shit no matter what. <laughs> like, well, like, even if you succeed and yeah. everyone yeah. leaves, yeah. it's almost like I get scared that it's better to keep the big traditional religions that have all different aspects to them, the more liberal parts, the more conservative parts, than it is to just unleash millions of people out of their religion so that they can join even crazier groups of yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens, both great writers and speakers on the importance of getting rid of religion. Could you tell us one thing that you think each man does really well and one thing that you think each man could have or could still improve upon? Oh. I didn't. Oh. It, I, Christopher I, I, Hitchens and Sam Harris, one thing they do well, one thing they could improve upon. Well, Christopher Hitchens can't really improve upon anything. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I, I think um, Christopher Hitchens... Uh, <laughs> I mean, got it, got it wrong over it, the Iraq war. I oh think. my God! Um, Ugh. And um, I think he's also wrong on abortion. He would, he was, he was. Um, uh, was I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so I, I never had, I never argued with him about either of those things. That a good rule in life was never argue with Christopher Hitchens. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I, I think. I mean, he, his, I've, so certainly his, his reasons for supporting the Iraq war were extremely passionate. He, he'd been to Iraq, he'd seen what, what an utter monster Saddam Hussein was. But I wonder whether even he, if, if he saw the, the aftermath now, um, where almost certainly we could, we could say that ISIS is, 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 a, is a consequence of the American invasion of, yes. of, of Iraq. Um, I did argue with him about Iraq. Did you? Yes. yes. I mean, you know. I'm sure he was very gentlemanly about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so angry at him about that. But anyway, I did love him, but that was wrong. He was yeah. wrong. He's wrong. Um, Sam Harris, uh, I, I, suppose, I mean, many, many people criticize him for his spiritualism, his, his um, was almost Buddhism. Um, I, I think it has to be said, he, he, he's, he's not a religious Buddhist. I mean, he, he believes in meditation. Uh, and, and has practiced meditation for much of his life. He's an expert meditator. Uh, and I think he thinks of it as a sort of physiological technique, which is immensely valuable, and Buddhists have had many centuries in which to perfect it. Uh, but I, so I, I don't think he can be blamed for actually being religious. He's not. He's one of the most clear-thinking... Uh, but you know where he's wrong? 
Even though I do love him, yeah. and we are friends, but his views on gun control are crazy. Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. like, he's yeah. really... Yes. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I love him. I do yeah. love him. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, excuse me, I'm really terrified right now. Um, <laughs> so I'm a high school biology teacher. I teach um, 10th grade biology. Yay, biology! Uh, and my students and I just finished an exploration of human evolution in my classroom, and I had a student ask me a phenomenal question. That Can you I'm talk a bit slower? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and louder. My, okay, my students and I just finished an exploration of human evolution in my classroom, and my student asked a really great question that I've struggled with because I am, um, I'm not openly secular because as a teacher I have to maintain a fine balance of, you know, how do I work in a relatively religiously conservative community um, and maintain a good relationship with my students and keep them open-minded in the classroom. But the question was, um, my student asked, my faith says one thing, but science says another. What do you say? My what says one thing? My faith says one thing and science says another. Wait, my what says one thing? Faith. Oh, my faith. Sorry, I, I, yeah. I the, thought it was my feet. It was like, <laughs> yep, no, my, no, their feet aren't saying the, anything. The, um, the so, yeah, problem so, is... The, pro the, pr the, the problem is the loudspeakers are facing out into the auditorium, so we're not hearing it properly up, okay. up here. Um, so my faith says one thing and my and you're mind a, says you're another. A, you're a teacher, and d did you say that, that you have problems with teaching uh, s science because people say to you, my faith says one thing, my science no, says No, I would another. like to know how do you think um, I should respond to a question like that when I don't feel comfortable admitting that I am openly secular in a religious environment. Um, and how do Is I keep students school? be open-minded, but explorational at the same time, if that so makes how, sense? So how, how should you respond to what one of your pupils? Is, yes. Is that the question? <laughs> one of my students. <laughs> um, Sorry, maybe this is a student question. Yes. Um, well, um, <laughs> Your faith is rubbish. <laughs> oh, but I recognize that, 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 might, that might not be very helpful. I, I recognize that. I, I'll leave it to Julia to Okay, give now I would be softer. I would say some people might say your faith is rubbish, not me, <laughs> just people I've heard. Um, I would say. I think your faith is your culture and you want to give honor to your culture like everyone does because humans need other humans and communities. And when you say faith, I think, well, I guess then you're telling them what you think. But anyway, I would try to say something that doesn't dismiss faith as a bad thing but redefines faith as being a participant in a community you love. See, switcheroo. And that that's important, but also understanding the facts of science is really, really important because that's gonna make you a smart, skeptical, good, you're gonna know how to get through life with all of your great critical thinking skills and part of that is understanding biology and that part of that is seeing the world in a biological way. Something, I would do something like that. Yeah, th I think that, that's good too. I mean, I, I think that, <gasps> um, uh, but, but I mean, <laughs> another, another thing you might, you might say is, okay, your faith, where does it come from? Um, if you had been born in Afghanistan, would your faith be the same? If you had been born in Bombay? Yeah, that's a good one. That's um, a really good one. Uh, do, do you have any real reason to, to believe the faith that your parents and grandparents happen to have brought you up in, um, as opposed to the faith that you would have been brought up in? Although, although, like my mom would say, well, God has provided a lot of different religions for everyone to be part of from, based on where they grew up. Like, I mean, you know, like there's ways to think of it and still believe and just say everyone has their own expression, you know, but ours is Catholic and theirs is Hindu and theirs is this and it's all good. Well, I would hope the child would see through that. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm going to university for um, zoology, so this is for Richard Dawkins. 
I was wondering, do you remember the time you fell in love with biology or zoology? And if you do, could you express that to us? Because I'd love to know about it. Uh. Like, do you remember the moment, or do you know, remember why you decided to study it? To study zoology? Yeah, when, oh, okay. when you really knew. Um, Thank well, you. I don't have a very good story about that. Um, I, I'm sorry to say that I was never a dedicated bird watcher or flower collector or insect hunter. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a natural naturalist. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> That's a good title for a book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the naturist naturalist. Um, I drifted into it, really, uh, because my father had been... My father really was a naturalist. And so I kind of followed in his footsteps without really knowing why I did. And that's not a very good reason to do anything. Um, but that meant that when I got to Oxford, I, was, I read zoology at Oxford. And then my interest really did take off. So I was rather a late developer in that respect, and the interest that took off was more of a philosophical interest. It was the, the power of biology to answer the big questions of existence. Uh, why, why are we here? What's it all about? Um, what's the purpose of life? These are questions which traditionally religions have tackled and failed at, and uh, I recognized that biology was, was the field which could answer many of those questions. Not all of them, physics can answer the others. Um, and so about in my second year at Oxford, I became deeply enthusiastic about, about biology and read a lot of books. And, but all, it was always the philosophical angle. And, and, and only lately have I started to become more of, more of a naturalist. I'm still no good at identifying birds, but I'm happy for hours with a pair of binoculars looking for them. <laughs> Hello. So, uh, 39 years ago, uh, in your wonderful book and my all-time favorite book, The Selfish Gene, you coined the term meme. And now that term has memed into something completely different, used on Facebook and the internet daily for, you know, craziness. That's nothing to do with your original definition of it. What is your thoughts on how the term meme has memed? <laughs> a, a, a meme is, is just the cultural equivalent of a gene, insofar as there is a cultural equivalent. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate that, at the end of the selfish gene, which was all about genes, uh, that Darwinism can in principle work with anything that is self-replicating in the universe. And in principle, uh, it could be quite a lot of different things, and maybe a lot of different things in other, on other planets. But I thought it would be helpful to look on this planet and see whether there was another possible self-replicating unit which could potentially serve as a unit of Darwinian selection. The meme, the unit of cultural inheritance, anything that spreads like an epidemic through society, like a tune, a clothes fashion, a craze, that spreads through a school, a, to a toy that all the children want to have. Um, in, any of those things are potentially a, a meme if they're copied with high fidelity from brain to brain and therefore are uh, possibly subject to a natural selection of a sort. The tunes that get whistled around the streets are good tunes, not, not bad tunes, etc. Um, now, the internet was unforeseen, certainly unforeseen by me at the time when I wrote The Selfish Gene. Uh, and it has, of course, proved to be an amazing ecology for memes. Uh, when I wrote about The Selfish Gene, I was thinking of people whistling tunes to other people. I wasn't thinking of memes spreading at the speed of light, practically, um, through the internet. Um, and so the internet has provided a, a superb ecosystem of memes, and that's wonderful. And, and there's e even been rather interesting research using the internet. There's one very nice example, which was uh, a few summers ago, there were riots in London. I can't remember what the original cause was, but people were rioting and smashing shop windows, and there was chaos in the streets, and the police were having difficulty keeping control. And during these riots, there was a rumor that somebody had released 
a tiger from the London Zoo, which was rampaging through the streets of London, terrorizing the city. Uh, this wasn't true, but it provoked a rash, an epidemic of tweets on Twitter about this tiger. And somebody had the bright idea of representing this graphically on a map where you had circles whose either area or, um, or, or diameter, I, f I forget which, um, were, was proportional to the number of retweets of the tiger rumor. So you had green circles geographically representing um, retweets of the tiger rumor in London. And then there were, there were red circles representing tweets and retweets of a counter, um, not rumor, quite a, I mean, the, the, the anti-rumor, which saying, no, there's no tiger, it's all lies, it's all, it's all. And gradually the green circles were replaced by the red circles. And so you could actually see the natural selection of the truth in this case, which was that there was no tiger, taking over from the, uh, the wild rumor that, that began, which was the... So that was a, a beautiful example of, of natural selection of memes, in this case, of retweets. Um, the, what you're talking about, the so-called internet meme, is a very particular subset, which is a, a silly picture with a caption. And, and um, uh, the, the, in a, I mean, the, the, to the extent that those things spread, they are memes. But what would be very wrong would be to think that that's what a meme means. It's just a tiny, tiny subset of what a, what a meme is. When one's a Christian, they're taught that they're the center of the universe, the purpose for creation. And when one abandons Christianity or many of the other Abrahamic religions, you're thrust into this position of having to understand these moral questions of our place as humans amongst the rest of these creatures that seem to have a purchase on life as well. Daniel Dennett, whom you mentioned, has answered this question himself, but I want to know from you, Professor Dawkins, as a biologist and atheist, how you've wrestled with the morality of how we as humans relate to animals, questions like eating meat or keeping them captive in zoos. The, the, the biology of morality, the, the evolution of morality, is that the question? I, I, well, how, again, you, how do you feel about how our relationship is with animals? Oh, Understanding with animals. that we're another animal, like the fact that we're eating animals or, yes, or okay. trapping animals or caging animals. Right. Um, I think that, that evolution d does have moral implications in this, in this respect. Um, our morality, pretty, pretty universally, is speciesist. This word coined by Richard Ryder and popularized by Peter Singer. <laughs> um, by analogy with, with, with racist. So um, it's taken us pretty axiomatic in our morality and our political system even that the human species is unique and has an absolute wall around it and all other species, we've got to treat them kindly but they're not human, I mean they're, they're somehow other. So there's humans versus the rest. And so when you get something like the abortion debate um, all the argument is when does human life begin? Does it begin at conception? Does it begin after the last possible opportunity for these um, embryo to split into two and make identical twins because that would raise the embarrassing question of which twin gets the soul? Think about it. <laughs> um, or does, does human life begin at this, this trimester or that of that tri trimester. Note that all the emphasis is on, is on human. You, if, only, if you could just point out quite simply that um, the, 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 the human embryo is quite obviously far less capable of feeling pain or fear than an adult cow or pig. Yet because, it's not, because a cow and a pig is not human, that somehow ruled out. It doesn't matter. They're not. They're not human. Um, the, the, the human embryo is human, and therefore is sacred. Well, this is deeply unevolutionary. Obviously, uh, another way to express that would be to say: Imagine, as a thought experiment, and nothing wrong with thought experiments, that the intermediates that link us to, say, chimpanzees had happened not to go extinct. We are 
linked by our ancestors going back, 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 back to whatever it is, eight million years ago, to the common ancestor with chimpanzees, and then there's another set of links from the common ancestor to modern chimpanzees. That means that if only they hadn't gone extinct, we would be joined to modern chimpanzees by an unbroken chain of intermediates, all of which would have been classified in the same species as each other. There would have been no sudden cut-off point, all of which could have mated with, in a fertile way, their immediate neighbors in the chain. So if you imagine the chain ranged out uh, across, as I've done, across Africa, um, with humans at one end and uh, chimpanzees at the other, holding hands. And each one in the chain would be the same species as the next one in the chain and capable of interbreeding with the next one in the chain. And yet at one end we have humans, the other end we have chimpanzees. And you could do the same thing for any other animal you like. You could do it for kangaroos, humans and kangaroos. There's, there is always going to be a chain of intermediates linking us to every other species a chain of, in, of, of in intermediates, every one of whom would have been regarded as the same species as its neighbor. It's paradoxical, but you can see immediately that it follows from the evolutionary uh, worldview. It's a, it's a matter of sheer accident that the intermediates between us and chimpanzees are all extinct. That's the only thing that enables us to be speciesist and to, to lock chimpanzees away in cages in zoos or do experiments on them which we would not do, we wouldn't, even, we wouldn't do to a, to a human embryo. Uh, and do we really want to base our morality on the merest accident that the intermediates just happen to be extinct? It's a very convenient thing that they're extinct because it really does mean that we can draw a line around the human species because there aren't any inter intermediates. And it's very unlikely that any intermediates will be discovered. And it's, one can make the thought experiment that somebody might find intermediates in some African forest. And that would throw us into a moral pandemonium because you'd then have to have, in order to maintain our speciesist morality, you would then have to have courts of law like they had in apartheid South Africa to decide whether somebody passes for white. You'd have to have courts of law to decide whether some intermediate passes for human. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. Um, but that's just two indications of where the evolutionary worldview potentially could drive a coach and horses through our, our, uh, mor our present moral system with respect to other animals. Okay, this is the last question. Yes, um, before I ask my question, I want to thank you very much for spending some time with us. <clears throat> Richard, um, I believe that most of our experience would say that we, the first time we heard the, the, the word truth, definitely an absolute truth, but even the word truth was during catechism or, or religious classes, not during science classes. And that science is more about the method, the hypothesis testing, not about the truth. I feel that you have a different interpretation about that. Could you please explain? Well, this, this is a, um, an, an, an orthodoxy in philosophy of science that there, there's no truth. Um, all we can do is to fail to falsify our approximations to the truth. And um, certainly the history of science can be interpreted in this way that hypotheses get set up and then uh, they can be rejected or they can fail to be rejected. And if they fail to be rejected, then they go forward and they regard it as an approximation to uh, the truth. But we don't actually use the word truth because it could, it's always open to the possibility of their being falsified one day. Um, this is a respectable strand of philosophy of science. I think it can be exaggerated. I think that there are plenty of things that we now know absolutely are true. We know that uh, the planets of the solar system orbit the sun. That's not a hypothesis waiting to be disproved. It's just plain true. 
and uh, we have um, under our belt now quite a large number of things that we know are true. There are other things that we don't yet know are true. There are other things which can still be regarded as hypotheses that have so far failed to be falsified. If you want to reconcile these two points of view, you could say something like this. The hypothesis has not yet been falsified, despite numerous strenuous attempts to falsify this, this hypothesis, and therefore it would be perverse to withhold the accolade of truth from this hypothesis. And that would apply to the hypothesis that the planets orbit the sun. In my view, in my more, very strong view, it would apply to uh, evolution. Evolution is just plain true. Uh, the evidence is so strong that to withhold... It would, it, it would be perverse to, to say anything else. Um, the hypothesis that natural selection is the main driving force of evolution, that is a hypothesis which, which is open to doubt, is open to criticism, is open to test. Uh, and so I would not say that that's definitely true th at this stage. Uh, but I think that particular kind of philosophy uh, can be exaggerated. And before we finish, I just wanted to say, um, in the book signing, I'm always delighted to sign books. It's a, it's a great pleasure. But we do have a big crowd tonight, and I hope we'll have a very big book signing queue. And out of consideration for those who find themselves at the end of the book signing queue, I'm going to ask, as your indulgence, um, that you don't ask me to personalize my signature. Um, I don't know whether Julia agrees with that, but... but I um, disagree, no. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, it, 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 it seems to me to be un unfair on the people at the end of the, of the line if I spend a, a lot of time, or we spend a lot of time um, tr trying to work out how to, how to spell a particular name and it, with, with love to Uncle Charlie and, and things like that. <laughs> um, and and I, I think we both agree about selfies as well, that they also take an enormous amount of time. Yes. Um, and we absolutely hate them. Yes. <laughs> Selfies and youth feet. Um, also, the the book that's for sale, that's my book, isn't my most recent book. That God said ha is about me having cancer and my brother having cancer that I wrote 20 years ago, um, before I lost my faith even. Um, so I would encourage you if you were looking for a book of mine, if you haven't, if you've already bought it, it's a good read. I'm glad you bought it. Um, but if you were looking for something of mine, I wrote a memoir a couple of years ago called If It's Not One Thing, It's Your Mother. And then also um, Letting Go of God, you can um, get from Amazon. It's on DVD. And Strongly that's, recommended. That's the, that's the best way to yeah. have my things. Yeah. But I'm happy to sign your books. And that's uh, it. We have to get up very early in the morning, too. All right. Thank you Thank very you much. Very this is really great.